Good day. Today is January 17th, 2024. Happy New Year. I'm Derek Fildebrandt, publisher of the Western Standard, and you're watching The Pipeline. I'm back again. Um, I've been uh, unknowingly poisoning myself daily. I found out just yesterday that Quaker is uh, poisoned. It's delicious harvest crunch that I eat for breakfast two out of every three days, and so I'd be sick for a few days. Be so uh, sick I couldn't eat. I'd get better. And as soon as I was hungry again, I'd eat some Harvest Crunch and poison myself all over. So I've, I've been absent for a bit, but we figure out, figured out what is a, what's it called um, when someone, uh, it's a weird thing, when you, like someone might poison a child. To, what's it? Uh, Munchausen by proxy. Munchausen, uh, some, Munchausen by proxy. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, so I was just poisoning myself to take care of myself and feel good about doing so. So uh, I'm back. But so is Western Standard Opinion Editor. I was Nigel never away. Oh, well, you're yeah, but you're back always. Well, you never left. Here I am. Yeah. yeah. Also joining us, kind of like old times, Western Standard <clears throat> News Editor Dave Naylor. It's been a while since we've done a pipeline together. It has. It has. That's a good times roll. You're normally on the pipeline when I'm not here. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, we should say Corey's not here. Well, this time it's because Corey's not yes, here. Our so. beloved Corey is away. For some well-deserved uh, time off, I think. Uh, down, well, we're not even going to mention where he is. Somewhere warm. Somewhere warmer than here, which is anywhere but here. Um, we've got a good show today. Uh, Ottawa says, let the Western bastards freeze in the dark. Ottawa not backing down from its plan to impose uh, net zero policies on Alberta and Saskatchewan by 2030, uh, essentially requiring that we just use wind and solar, which will go so great in weather like this. Uh, Alberta's grid being pushed to the absolute breaking point with an emergency alert going out, I think, two days in a row. Um, just one. Just one? There was early grid alert. Uh, yeah. Okay. But yeah. And grid uh, warning. Yeah, grid warning. Uh, that When we came to the absolute breaking point where we could have seen some rolling outages, which would have been pretty bad in weather like this. Um, I would have just had to build a campfire in my living room or something. I don't know. But um, uh, but also uh, closer to home here, uh, Alberta NDP leader and former premier, uh, Rachel Notley, announcing her coming retirement uh, just yesterday, announcing that uh, she'll be stepping down as NDP leader. Not very surprising. We've talked about it before, but now it's official. Uh, the machinery of the party is going to begin rolling, and I know maybe some of you might roll your eyes. Ah, it's NDP leader, but Alberta is now a competitive political environment, and, and this matters. So we're going to get into it, and who our potential replacements might be, what the race might look like. Someone who I don't expect to be running for NDP leader, Jordan Peterson, um, losing a court battle, uh, <clears throat> which seems to uh, now confirm he's going to be headed to sensitivity training to be nicer to liberals on Twitter and things like that. Uh, the court upholding ruling of the Ontario College of uh, Psychiatrists. Psychiatrists. Psychologists. 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 Mm -hmm. I don't actually know the difference. I know there's one. Psychiatrists can write you a prescription. Psychologists can just tell you to get well. Oh. Okay. Well, there, there you, you are. So I, so I, and I already forgot which one's which. Yeah. So, uh, but either way, uh, you know the college uh, ruling he he needs sensitivity training because he hurts uh, the feelings of liberals online, and uh, the court's upholding very strangely that he has to do this. I, for one, look forward to the video footage of these sensitivity training sessions. Uh, so that's that. Before we get into it, though, we want to thank uh, my favorite sponsor, the Canadian Shooting Sports Association. I've been a CSSA member for over a decade, trusting them to defend my rights as a firearms owner in Canada. The CSSA is on Parliament Hill and across Canada defending your rights to own and safely and legally use firearms in Canada. Without the CSSA, God knows uh, how few gun rights we'd have left by now. Uh, it's important for all gun owners to be uh, members of this great organization. If you're not yet a member, go to cssa-cila.org and uh, join up today. Just do what I do, though. It's much easier. Just, just Google these guys and join a member. It's important that all gun owners get together and uh, fight for the common cause on this one. All right. Well, you know, the old saying, the old bumper sticker was, let the Eastern bastards freeze in the dark, coming, you know, in the fights between uh, Peter Lougheed and... Pierre Trudeau, you know, when uh, we shut off uh, the oil and gas to the east, 
during fight over the national energy program you know the the saying was well let them let the eastern bastards freeze in the dark so you know we actually did turn off the oil and gas for a bit to let them freeze in the dark let them stew in their greed and trying to steal alberta's energy wealth um but i think the the saying might have some applicability in the other direction right now um maybe just tee up what the situation is dave with um Ottawa appearing to have zero willingness to budge <coughs> on uh, its imposing um, federal regulations on Alberta's exclusively provincial energy grid, um, showing no willingness really to to budge in the face of extreme cold weather like we're we're seeing right now. No, and it you know it was let the, the the Westerners almost did freeze in the dark. You know temperatures were dropping to record lows. Uh, uh, minus 50 with the wind chill factor. Temperatures I've never experienced in my lifetime. I'm not as old as Nigel, but I'm still pretty, still pretty old. And uh, you've just never been ice fishing. Yes, that's true. I haven't. No desire to. Seems like a very, very silly thing to do. Uh, freeze your butt off to try and catch a fish. But there you go. Um, the point is to drink beer and get away from the wife. I understand that. But I think there's warmer places to go and drink beer, and you're not going to fall through the ice. We digress. Um, yeah, it got really, really, really cold, uh, and the grid was, uh, they did put out the emergency alert. I think it was a Saturday night, and Albertans responded quickly. They turned off lights, and, and the, the pressure on the grid dropped dramatically. They put out another warning the next day uh, saying, look, uh, in, uh, be prepared. This could go to an emergency alert again, and once again, Albertans responded. But it was a very close call, and it was uh, sort of the, the, the worst of all factors coming together. Uh, no, no renewable stuff going out, solar or wind combined with the, the freezing temperature. And yeah, no, it was almost deathly silence. Uh, thank goodness for Saskatchewan. They fired up an old coal plant and got us going again. And Mo says, I'm not going to let people freeze to death. And if they want to charge me for firing up the coal plant, come and get me. You know my address. Uh, so God bless Saskatchewan. And really not a word, not a word out of Trudeau or his crazed environment minister, Gil Bow. Uh, Trudeau relaxing or uh, decompressing after his tough times in Jamaica, I guess. But uh, uh, the silence was absolutely deafening. Well, what could they say? No, no, it was like <laughs> this. You know, if you're sitting there in the in the powers of uh, the quarters of power in Edmonton, you're thinking this couldn't have happened at a better time. This could not have happened at a better time because I mean, what a way to prove your argument. I, I mean, I, I I don't have much use for Mr. Trudeau or Mr. Gilbo, but. I, we were very playful with our headline today. I don't think they actually said, let the Western bastards. It's the sentiment. Uh, uh, they it's probably, not what they said. Uh, they, probably, they probably think it sometimes, but I don't think that is or ever was the plan. It, this is actually worse. It is that they don't understand. Or that they understand but think that somehow it will all just work out if we give it another 13 years. Well, if we take their um, approach and just throw infinite money at it, you can fix anything. Yeah, well, and, and that's how they approach virtually yeah. every issue. So, uh, so really, this just illustrates the pure dumb folly of federal policy. I'm not even sure, given that uh, Daniel Smith says, yeah, we can do it, but give us until 2050. I'm not even sure that's great policy. But certainly the idea of trying to push all of this through by 2035 is just not on. The solid facts are that during the NDP years, we overbuilt solar and wind. And then we took the nameplate capacity of those plants and said, oh, we have this much more generating capacity without ever contemplating a situation such as we have just experienced where it's the middle of the night, so there's no solar, and the wind isn't blowing because you've got a particular form of air mass it doesn't generate any wind. Suddenly, you're back to a little bit of coal and a, a little bit of natural gas that you've still got left, plus what's over the border in Saskatchewan that they were kind enough to generate. We just have it out of balance. This can be fixed, but it's not going to be fixed by bringing in more solar and more wind. Um, yeah, and I, I, the, <clears throat> you know, the, the coal phase... <clears throat> which you know, a lot of people blame Notley for, and she accelerated it. But I mean, let, let's be fair here. We actually have to go back to the Harper government that, that phased this out, which was overreaching. The federal government has no business 
in the regulation of any provincial power grid. But the, you know, Harper seemed to get away without, a, without too much fuss at the time. But it, it does go back to there. And I think the Harper government was doing it as a, you know, a something they could show they were doing on global warming stuff without going full Kyoto, full full cop kind of stuff. So it was, it, it was a political maneuver, but it was still the wrong maneuver. Notley accelerated the coal yeah. phase out more aggressively than even that was. Uh, but, you know, now we're in this argument, well, should Alberta be net zero by 2030 or 2050? Alberta, Ottawa is supposed to have nothing to do with our grid no, at all. Mm -hmm. Zero, period. The Constitution's clear. I, th I think Alberta's position needs to be to stop bartering on this, that, hey, if you're not going to accept our 2050 targets, we're going to rip it up completely. We're just not going to have a net zero target. We're going to do what we want because you have no say in it whatsoever. I, I think we should stop this bickering. I think we should completely rip up our net zero targets if Ottawa is not going to accept. It may be the only out. way to go because they do think they have a say. They ignore yeah. court ruling after court ruling. doesn't seem to phase them. They'll change a couple words and, and uh, you know, we'll... we'll it, Two years from now, we'll be stuck in court still arguing the same thing. Yeah, no, so, they, they know they don't have a say. They just ignore the fact that, exactly. they, that, that, that they have no say. And, you know, you see it sometimes in negotiations where one side has the, the, the upper hand and they don't they respect the law or the regulations. They do what they want to do, pay the price later. I that's, what they, that's what these guys are up to. Well, you know, and it's not just the ability of the grid to have enough energy. It's the bloody prices. I, I'm renewing right now with uh, direct energy <coughs> on my... I have my five-year fixed contract, uh, fixed term contract is up, and uh, I'm facing rates three to four times what my what my rates were, mm -hmm. even going into a new fixed contract. It's like the prices right now are crazy, and but frankly, we're just lucky to have enough energy, uh, and there's just no way to do it if we were to do do what Ottawa says here. So mm -hmm. I, I think you're you're bang on, Nigel. That while it was terrible that the grid got as far as it was, it demonstrated uh, the Alberta government's point here, I think, better than they possibly could have with words or videos or commercials, um, because we saw in real time. We can only imagine the disaster that would have been the last few days if our entire grid would be, you know, wind and solar and unicorn farts. You know, one of the, one of the sad things about this is that there are idiots out there now saying, uh, it was all fixed, you know. They they actually cut back, and they and they sold power to Montana, and they did this. They wanted it to look bad. Well, there's conspiracy nothing, theorists on all sides, uh, and uh, nothing the greenies be, have got theirs. Nothing could be further from the truth. That was a close call. Thank you, Saskatchewan. Indeed. All right, well, uh, close to home here. Um, Alberta NDP leader, former NDP uh, Premier of Alberta, Rachel Notley, announcing uh, she'll be stepping down as leader. I don't think uh, she set a time yet, but uh, she informed her caucus, uh, apparently over kind of a rushed Zoom call, which leads one to think that the timing was a bit out of her hands on something. Something something had gone wrong, because the caucus intends to meet in person next week. So, And, and normally, something like that, you want to do in person, you know, and everybody stands and har harumps the leader and pats you on the back and hugs and whatnot. It's, uh, so it's, a bit strange time. So something obviously happened internally to to bring this up. Perhaps leadership campaigns wanting to get going, or I don't know, someone had a story, etc. But uh, in any case, uh, stepping down, she's led the NDP since I believe uh, I guess it would have been 2014. So 10 years now she's been the leader, and mm -hmm. she's been an MLA. I think about 10 years before that, roughly 2004. I mean, going back, uh, that would have been the end of the Klein government. So she she is. She's been around a long time. In fact, I guess she was in the legislature the last time an Alberta premier was re-elected, which would have been Klein in 2004. I would have been, uh, geez, I would have been in high school, the tail end of high school at the time. Uh, just kind of a reminder of how turbulent and un... The lack of job security in the, uh, the job of Alberta premier. But uh, she's been around a long time. I don't think this is unexpected. She's had... Three leader, uh, three elections as leader, two in a row now, a loss, but nonetheless leaving the NDP in, rem in a remarkably stronger position than she found it when she became leader. Four seats, and four seats was actually a fairly good accomplishment for the NDP historically. You know, her and her father was uh, uh, the NDP leader. He was often just by himself, one MLA. 
I think uh, his high water mark was two MLAs. Uh, that was his high water mark, uh, Grant Motley. When she took over, it was four MLAs. She leaves it now with, I don't know, 35, 38, a, a very significant, very large uh, opposition caucus, the biggest opposition caucus in Alberta history. And so while wow, coming off of two losses, she leaves the NDP in a remarkably stronger place than she found it. But still, while well, as likable as she might be, she still had a pretty rough four years as premier. Some would say disastrous. I suppose it depends on one's point of view. But uh, obviously not able to break through and 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 time time to ride into the sunset, at least as Alberta leader. Um, so with you, Nigel, your your thoughts on uh, Notley finally making it official that she's uh, she's stepping down. Well, first of all, that means that lots of people can now collect on their bets. So that's that's a good thing. Don't forget, with. i got to pat ourselves on the back right here. We were the first to report it last year. Yes. Oh, okay, but to be fair, it was a pretty good bet she was going to step down. Uh, uh, nobody else reported it, though. Uh, yeah, mm. and we had we uh, the broad outlines of what we reported, how it was going to work roughly, were correct. But, I mean, it's like predicting that there'll be a lunar eclipse at some point. Uh, uh. I, you know, I think the um, I think the singular accomplishment of Rachel Notley, much as I deplore most of her ideas, was the fact that she was able to get rid of the lunatic fringe on the NTP, who had ideas that were not only more deplorable but made them completely unelectable. You just made reference to the extremely small caucus numbers that they had prior to her coming along and the relatively strong position in which she now leaves them. She had um, a knack for sidelining the people who we have the, we have the equivalents on the conservative side of the, of the movement. She managed to get them out of the way and present Albertans with something that they could vote for in a moment of disgust with the 40-year progressive conservatives. I mean, it wasn't a success. It, she, you could say that she, she, you know, she brought in a $15 minimum wage. Well, guess what? You just, you just take away jobs from high school students when you do that kind of thing. The climate strategy that she advanced, uh, concentrated on the four large producers, left the whole junior oil, oil producers out of the equation. Um, Low oil gas is not responsible for the low oil gas price, uh, oil and gas prices, but she did bring in the carbon tax, which was widely disliked, and she's generally perceived as being far, far too close with Prime Minister Trudeau. And there are some pictures which seem to indicate that there was a, a bond of affection there, and the admiration that she had for him as the ultimate progressive, and. Uh, Albert's got sick of that. But she did do that. She made the NDP electable. And that's going to be the challenge for the next leader of the NDP, because the crazies are still out there, yeah. as you may have noticed from Twitter. So you know, some of them may run for leadership. I no, we hope so. We certainly yeah. hope so. Yeah. So I, I, Nigel is correct in that she sidelines some of the most extreme. Most, they weren't purged, but sidelined them out of being front row center in the party, the, the more fringe, extreme left characters. But at the same time, I, I think it's fair to say she both mainstreamed a lot of harder left ideas, made the ideas more mainstream, which is a sign of a good leader, regardless of if you agree with those policies or not. It's not moving to the center, but moving the center to whichever side you're at. And I think she succeeded somewhat in doing that on, on only certain issues. But at the same time, I think... Um, uh, even more, uh, th this is not, I think, focused enough on by the, the commentariat, is that she united the left. I mean, uh, you know, Daniel Smith got, what was it? It was about 50%, 51% of the vote. Mm -hmm. In almost any jurisdiction in Canada, that gets you a ridiculously big majority government because there's a multi-party system. This would have been, under any other conservative premier, one of the biggest majorities in Alberta history. But in fact, it's a, not a huge, it's not a big, big majority. It's a comfortable, but not a big majority because Notley completely eliminated her competitors on the left and the center left. And that began with the liberals and the liberals were 
removing themselves from the political gene pool long before Notley came along. She she benefited from their own terminal decline, but then she sped that up, brought it along, and then the last cycle eliminated the Alberta Party, which, despite all its claims, was a center left political party. So she united the left without any mergers or whatnot. She just proved to be the stronger horse in Darwinian terms. Uh, she she it was survival of the fittest, and the others were just were just too weak. Um, what do you think were the main things? Uh, responsible for Notley uh, being able to both win power in 2015, but then also position the NDP as a permanent and strong contender for power. I think it's just because of, of, of her leadership. She is so far and above the rest of the party. Uh, you know, like there, there's Rachel Notley and then, okay, who else is an NDP star in Alberta? There's, there's really, there's really nobody. And you sort of see that already by the sort of lack of no-name candidates, or that people really don't know. So her 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 force of personality was so strong; she was able to will it, uh, you know, and 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 get her get her that get her way uh, through that. But uh, you know what? A, a lot of people say it was a fluke one-time election, and uh, people were not voting for the NDP; they were voting against the arrogance of the progressive conservative party, and they would have voted in. Uh, the rhinoceros party, if they were on the uh, on the thing, and the, the NDP got lucky. Uh, I don't think it's luck that she's taken it now to uh, to where it is, and it is basically, as, as Derek says, a two party battle in Alberta now uh, between uh, the UCP and the NDP. I think there's one other key component in her success, and that is the undiluted support that she receives from the trade union movement and the Alberta Teachers Association. I mean, there are some good personal linkages with both of those organizations. Both of them, I think, took the view, here's somebody who actually might be able to do it. We'll put our force behind them. They didn't feel that way about her predecessors. Well, and, I, and I think you touched on this importantly. I think it's, it's maybe the possibly the single biggest uh, factor in her success and near successes was her, her opposition. In 2015, she faced the perfect storm. All the planets in the universe lined up. You had the PCs just absolutely begging to be taken behind the shed and shot. And you had the Wild Rose, which had gone through an unprecedented moment in the history of Westminster democracies, where then Wild Rose leader Daniel <clears throat> Smith, two thirds of the opposition crossed the floor, killed themselves. The Wild Rose was in bizarre chaos. Um, it's Leader at the time, Brian Jean, was on the job less than a week when the election was called, was not ready for that kind of profile at the time. She had a perfect storm and, and managed to come out. With it. Now, and she handled it well. She took, she capitalized on it, but she had a perfect storm. 20, in 2019, I don't think she could have won. People wanted her gone and they were going to vote for the Conservatives no matter what. If Jason Kenney had stayed around, though, she would have had her opposition doing her work for him. Again, I think it's very difficult to see how she, she could have won this last election if the Conservatives had not made the leadership changes they, they had. So a bit heartbreaking for her. She had spent four years preparing the NDP, leading the polls, leading fundraising. She looked like she was going back to the Premier's chair just this year until, well, I guess technically last year, until, uh, until the Conservatives finally made some changes. So she could have very well come back. So she might have two losses in a row under her belt there, but... It was a closer thing than I think some people remember. Let's turn towards uh, what comes next for the NDP. We've talked a bit about this in the past. Um, start with you, uh, Dave, on who do you think the main contenders are going to be? And then maybe who some of the, well, maybe not main contenders, but people are going to throw their hat in and provide some entertainment. See what happens. Yeah. I was talking to a, a top NDP uh, a source today, and here's the rundown he gave me. He says, it's no doubt. Gandley is going to win. No doubt uh, she'll win. She'll win. Really? Uh, he says the, uh, oh, sorry, I shouldn't identify the sources as, as, uh, by sex. They say. Uh, that uh, it's NDP. NDP. It, she he does not mean no, he exactly. necessarily, and she does not mean she necessarily. So. Uh, the source says Gandley's got uh, large support already from caucus, and more importantly, caucus members who were in the cabinet uh, when they were in power. Uh, Shannon Phillips, he predicts, is not running. Uh, David Shepard, a, a well-respected within the party, Edmonton MLA, 
is running, according to the uh, the source. Uh, sadly, Gil McGowan is not running. <sighs> Sadly, because we would have loved to have run the picture of him giving us the finger mm -hmm. in every mm -hmm. single story uh, in, involving... Uh, I'm going to have to write Gil. I, Gil. You know what? I, Gil, if you're watching right now, if you run, I will take out a membership and I will vote for you. Just for you. So what the source says is uh, the kingpins in the, in, the, in the last leadership race was uh, a family called the O'Halloran family mm -hmm. in Edmonton. Very key NDC, NDP, strong union supporters. They have not yet come publicly announced who they are going to uh, uh, support. But the source says that they will announce that it will be Ganley. And when you get the O'Halloran support, then you get their, the union foam bank that comes along with it. And then all of a sudden, you've got a dozen, two dozen people manning the phones uh, to, to round up signatures for you. So, uh, it's going to be, you know, there may be some people that come out of the cracks. Uh, I think Nigel, you were talking about David Egan, maybe, uh, uh, earlier on today, uh, will a federal, uh, you know, will somebody from the federal party come back and, and take a run? Um, you know, so it, it's going to be interesting, but, uh, I think right now it's Ganley's to lose. Well, Nigel, I'm, I, I think Ganley is going to be a major contender and very well could win. I'm, I'm not at the point yet where I think it's, it's hers to lose, but I think she's a strong contender. And if I was a new Democrat, just from a winnability perspective, I think she'd be good to go with. She's, she's intelligent. She's well-spoken, uh, telegenic. I think she probably has some work to do in the charisma department, but that, you know, that can be worked on. And, and, and actually her, her charisma is actually, improved a hell of a lot since she was first uh, elected and became justice minister. So she's grown a lot as a, as a retail politician. Uh, but I think we're also going to see Sarah Hoffman in there. Uh, she was deputy mm -hmm. premier and health minister under, under Notley, still a key um, right-hand woman of, of Notley and, uh, you know, since their time in government. Um, and, and, and a few others. Who, who do you think, will, other than Ganley, who do you think will be the big main contenders? So, um, well, certainly Sarah Hoffman, she, has, she was deputy premier for a while. She was a former teacher, and that's like, like being a, a miner or a railway locomotive driver in the old British Labour Party. You know, this is your core stock. So for the NDP, a civil servant or a teacher, that, mean, that gives you immense credibility. And by the way, to your point about Kathleen uh, Ganley's charisma, none of the people who she is going to be running against are going to exceed her in charisma. That's true. This is not, like Rachel Notley, love her or not, Rachel Notley was worth watching. This, these people are not, um, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're a gray crowd. And um, so one of the names that's been floated is Rod Loyola. He tried in 2014 and got nowhere. I think he came in with 2% of, uh, of the vote. He technically ran against Notley. Notley and David Egan. Uh, that's yeah. that's right. Well, he Is was he our communist friend? That's our communist oh, friend. Oh, He's yes. the Hugo communist. They're, they're, right. they're still talking about him as a, as a possibility. I can't see it. I think the communist connection would be perceived. I'm happy to as, stop calling him a communist if he will denounce communism. Well, But he has not denounced communism. He has not. And I think this would take you back into the world of the weird and the wacky, which the NDP... They well, don't go there. got away from. So I can't see that happening. But he is out there. As here are the top six picks and so forth. Um, Ron Loyola, Sarah Hoffman, and uh, there is a Janice I, Irwin. Janice Irwin. Well, we can I, see her run. She won't win, but uh, I think she could run. It would be a an interesting race indeed. And Did I say she's? There's a lawyer up in Edmonton by the name of Rocky Pancholi, who's... Um, yeah, I hear that name a lot. Uh, why she would have a special in, I don't know, but she keeps coming up in the conversation, but I'm not aware of anything <laughs> particular that she's done. Well, well, she didn't serve... Um, she's one of their rare stars among NDPs, uh, New Democrats, who they consider a star. She's considered a star, uh, and I think she's the only major one did not serve in the NDP government of 2015 to 2019. So she came after. Uh, she's young, telegenic woman, uh, I think fairly well spoken. I don't really know much about her politics. Again, she didn't serve as a minister, so we didn't really get much of 
substance. You know, she was in opposition, not, not government. But I, I think she'll she's expected to be a, a major contender and one who could possibly win. So one of the other things, and this is coming back to what uh, Dave was saying about the O'Halloran connection and the the gift that you get if you receive that particular thumbprint of approval with the the phone banks and everything. The way the vote is set up is that 75%, the, the, the membership vote counts for 75% that is so weighted. The other 25% goes to the, the people you don't hear so much about, the institutional supporters of the NDP. So when you said O'Halloran and you pointed that out, oh, yes, if you get the unions and the ATA working for you, and that's that 25%, if you can win them over, you are you are in a stronger, much much stronger position. You know, Nigel, this gets me thinking, and maybe you you should put someone on this. We need to figure out how the actual voting in the NDP works because it's not like most political parties with some version of one member one vote. They have that for that seventy five percent, but then there's the twenty five percent there, largely from unions. And does this mean someone could vote twice? Like, like if you're a member of a union. You get to vote through your union for the NDP leader, but then you could also take out an individual membership and vote for a leader. I, I don't know. Well, I would be, and, and, it's, yeah. it's, it's, and it's, I don't know. I'd be misleading viewers if I it, claim to. Well, it, it's it's a Byzantine system that yes. I think very few people, including myself, understand. So maybe that's a, a good opinion piece for you to commission, and, including many NDP supporters. I would venture. Yeah. You know, like I, they, I think they, I think that might be a good uh, a good column for you to commission, yeah. and let let's figure out. How the hell does the voting work? And is it possible to vote twice? Once on the union side, once on the more direct party side? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, how that influences works. Um, my question is, will any of the uh, candidates talk to us? Will Rachel Notley's ban on uh, talking to Western Standard reporters remain in effect or uh, come off? Depends what we're asking. Well, I was at the legislature a few months ago <clears> and I got... <throat> bunch of little handwritten notes during question period from the NDP. So they were talking to me that way, and, mm -hmm. and, and including from some leadership, expected leadership candidates. So we, we'll see. Maybe uh, maybe they're done sulking, and we'll talk to the standard again. We'll so, see. So the House monitor didn't come along and see what was going on, slap their hand and take the no, no, and, paper and, away? It, it's a weird thing. Even though, you know, we all have phones and stuff for texting and the old tradition that you know you get the write a little note and and on a little page you know a 12 or 15 year old will move it around to someone in the gallery other mlas there's still a lot of that and even when i was there for four years i i did it too i don't know why i don't well, know why but we again, like to do it because it's because you can because i can because someone's going to carry my note and further furthermore it's not searchable under freedom of information because it disappears as soon as you've read it well i mean they were sending it to me. I could have done whatever I wanted with it, but yeah, I wouldn't. Anyway. Okay, well, uh, let's turn uh, to one of our uh, our favorite perennial topics here, Jordan Peterson. It's Jordan Peterson, um, you know, a few years ago, uh, said some mean things on Twitter. Uh, some people did not like, uh, and some someone or, or several people complained about him to the College of people who deal with your head stuff. Psychologists. Shrinks. College of Shrinks. And um, it said some of the things that they're upset about is that he you know, he said some uh, mean things about Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, among other things. None of these people were his patients, or I believe even former patients. But nonetheless, the, uh, the College of Shrinks orders that uh, Peterson has to attend uh, social media sensitivity training or something of the like. And he obviously, you know, this is Jordan Peterson. He says, well, uh, bollocks that. I'm not doing it. Takes it to court. Uh, loses. Uh, appeals it to another higher court. And has now lost there, too. I think that was, I think that was yesterday, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, it seems he's got really two options. One, um, one day of his resign. Uh, from the college and just not practice. And I don't think he's actually really practicing much anymore. He makes infinitely more money selling books and doing shows and talks and things like that uh, as, as a largely global celebrity at this point. Or uh, the alternative might be that he goes to it and probably makes a mockery of it in some form. Uh, <clears throat> says, okay, well, I'm going to go here, but just so you know, I'm going <clears> to <throat> set my phone up in the corner uh, and we're going to 
or we're going to record what kind of weird 1984 re-education this is. Or he could appeal it. I don't know. Is there he any further way Surely he can go to the Supreme Court. If they would hear it. Uh, if they, if they the hear Supreme it. Court is highly unlikely to hear a case like this, but, I mean, if uh, they would essentially have to, his lawyers would have to prove that there is a charter or constitutional issue at stake here, yeah. which maybe there is, but it would have to be on kind of precedent-sending ground. So, well, I, I, I think he'll keep it alive. I think he'll try and keep the story alive as long as he can, and as you say, uh, maybe go and take it, all right? This is how stupid it is. And it's as stupid as you ordering Corey Morgan and I to take sensitivity training. Well, if anybody training. needs sensitivity training, it's you and Corey. Exactly. Uh, I'm the first to admit it. But it won't do me any good, and I will go along to it, and I will mock it, yeah. uh, which is what uh, obviously what uh, what Jordan's going to do. And you're right. He's, he, he is now a global superstar. Uh, you know, he's on Piers Morgan in Great Britain every, every other week. Uh, he's making loads of dough. So he's just sitting there laughing at this. It's the old adage. Uh, no publicity is bad publicity. And he's sitting there, bring it on, and how can I use this to my advantage? So, uh, what do you think he's going to do? You, you, you make him sound a bit of a, a, a little self-serving there. And, and no, I think he's a, business, he is, a businessman, right? Perhaps, what's what's best for Jordan Peterson? Perhaps he is. but well, It's also like, probably what's best in general. Like, he obviously shouldn't just go to it and take it seriously. <clears throat> he should mock mm, it. Absolutely. It is, it is for the public good that he mocks it and he ridicules it, exposes it for what it is. But here's the, here is the thing with everything that goes on around Jordan Peterson and his fight with the College of Psychologists. His fight is everybody's fight. <laughs> because the colleges of the professions, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about doctors, Psychologists, psychiatrists, real estate agents even, are all insisting on their members signing on to a particular world view. Right here in Alberta, the, college, the, um, uh, the, the Law Society has demanded that all members of the Alberta Bar go through a, a, a course on indigenous affairs. And there is a certain perspective that you are expected to show. If you don't do that... It's called then, the path. It's, it's, it's called the path, yes. Yeah. Well, we've, we've written on it. I mean, yeah, there's, there's a number of articles that, that have come out of this. Yeah. And uh, Glenn Blackett was, uh, was our original source on that, and uh, excellent material, which finally ended up in one of Ted Morton's books, by the way. I don't know whether you knew that, but one of know. our... one of you know, it's textbook quality is some of the stuff that's coming out in, in the, uh, the, the Western Standard. <laughs> anyway, um, point is, you lose your license if you don't fill in the dots. And this is finding its way. City Hall is rife with it. Even uh, institutions such as the ATB, Alberta Treasury Board Branch, are asking their employees, telling their employees to go and take the course. <laughs> and what happens if you don't take the course? Well, that remains to be seen because there have been too many test cases, but probably it's going to be an issue. And certainly if you, if you look in the literature, you can find lawyers now talking about, uh, about what could happen. I'd have to start to pick up Levitt, who's, uh, who writes in the, um, in the National Post, and um, he, he just says, some employees may wonder, can my employer force me to attend these workshops? What happens if I refuse? Well, the answer to the first question is they can't force you. The, second, uh, the answer to the second question is that actually an employer can terminate an employee for any reason if they give them enough severance. And if you refuse the instruction to go to one of these things, that might be caused and they wouldn't even have to pay several. It's like a vaccine mandate in a way. It's, uh, huh. you, know, you, you don't have to take it, no, but if you don't take it, you're going to get crazy fired. talk around here. It uh. immunizes you against conservatives. Mm. Yeah. Racism. Yeah. So, you know, it, the thing is, everybody gets scared. They say, well, look what they did to Jordan Peterson. I don't want that to happen to me. So if they can pin this off him, on him and make it stick, and he actually loses his license to practice, well, there's the test case that's the most effective, articulate exponent of the counterpoint of view gets axed, well, what's going to happen to somebody who's just a regular psychologist, regular doctor, regular any teacher, re regular anybody who bucks the system, well, they get fired, just like Jordan Peterson, who was 10 times as good at putting their case. 
So this is there. There's a lot of drive at the top level to chill Canadians, and that's why Peterson says it's no longer a free country, which is what he said in the article that we printed. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we ceased being a free country quite some time ago. Yeah, I don't think that's a new thing, but it's. It's it's a, yet another nail in the coffin. I mean, it's not an uncomfortable country. You go to the stores, there's mm -hmm. stuff to buy, and you can sometimes you can afford it. And then you get to drive your car to Banff on the weekend if you want. So far, it might not last. Well, they're but trying to take that. they're trying to take that away. But you know, it's a comfortable country. But it, call it the best billet in the barracks, if you like. But it is a barracks. You know, the differences between this country and Hungary in the 1960s are ones of degree none of kind. And this has developed in the last eight years. All right. Well, I think we'll uh, wrap it up there. I am depressed now. Yeah, well, we'll end it on that high note. Yeah. All right. Well, Nigel, Dave, thank you very much uh, for joining us on the pipeline today. And thank all of you for, uh, for joining us. If you're not yet a member of the Western Standard, we need you to join. The Western Standard is one of the very, very last media outlets in Canada that does not accept the federal government's media bailout uh, money. Instead, we rely on the membership and contributions of regular, everyday Westerners like you. If you're not yet a member of the Western Standard, please go to westernstandard.news, click on membership. It's only $10 a month or $100 a year to get unlimited access to all Western Standard content. It's good for you, and it's absolutely necessary if you want there to continue to be any free press left in Canada. Thank you very much for joining us and sharing your time with us today, and God bless. Canadian Shooting Sports Association. Without the CSSA, our gun rights would have been taken long, long ago. These guys are on the front lines uh, helping to draft smart and intelligent firearms regulations and legislation in Canada, and more importantly, educating the public about how we keep guns out of the hands of the wrong people. To become a member, it's absolutely worth every penny. You can become a Western Standard member for just $10 a month or $99 a 